We are continuing today in our Matthew Bible study in the Gospel of Matthew is where we've been. And uh, Matthew 3 is, is what we're in. And in the previous chapters, basically covered the genealogy of Christ and the birth of Christ and uh, just started to cover some of the people that, that are involved in that narrative of, of Christ's birth. And Matthew 3, starting at verse 1, begins... In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So about 28 to 30 years or so have passed, depending on what age Jesus was when the wise men came, probably around two or so. Now he's begun his, his public ministry at the age of 30. And so perhaps somewhere between 28 to 30 years have passed since we you know, last looked at Jesus in the Gospels. And Matthew now introduces a new prophet, John the Baptist, who comes preaching in the wilderness of Judea. He's still an Old Testament prophet at this time, even though we're in the New Testament, because Jesus' blood hasn't been shed yet. And so the new covenant has not yet been instituted. That's why later on, Jesus says that of those born of women, none has been greater than John the Baptist, but even those in the kingdom of God, anyone in the kingdom of God, I'm paraphrasing here, will be greater than him. And so, you know, John the Baptist was the culmination of all of the Old Testament prophets. He was the one that was calling out, you know, a voice crying in the wilderness, calling out to Jesus, pointing to Jesus as the Messiah. He was Jesus' forerunner. And he had one message, and it was to repent. And that's the topic of today's sermon in context of our Matthew 3 Bible study. It's the subject of repentance. And there's a lot of confusion today on repentance. It's one of the most confusing topics and doctrines of our day in the modern church. It's something, you know, that a lot of people have an idea of what repentance is. But I want to look at what the Bible actually says repentance is. And so we're going to look through some of that confusion today on, on the word repent. Now, what does it mean to repent? Is, it, is, the, is the gospel, when we're preaching the gospel, is the gospel turn from your sins and believe? You know, is it repent of your sins and believe the gospel? Turn from your wicked ways and believe the gospel? Or is it simply admit you're a sinner and come to Christ as you are? You know, those old church marquees that we would see, come as you are, right? That at the time they seemed kind of cliche, you'd see them everywhere, just come as you are, you know? Now I don't see those marquees as much anymore. You know, you see it sometimes, but were those old churches right? Is it come as you are? Is it simply know that you're a sinner, you know, before a holy and righteous God, admit you're a sinner and come to Christ in your sinful condition and get saved? Or is it repent of your sins? As in to turn from your sins, as you hear a lot of the street preachers preaching, right? You, you hear it on some, some street preachers doing some great work, uh, preaching, you know, against abortion, preaching abolitionism, doing all this. But a lot of times you'll hear, turn from your sins. You know, you're a whore, you're a fornicator, you have to turn and come to Christ. Well, what are you turning from? Are you turning from sin to come to Christ, or are you turning from something else? What, what does that word repent mean? Is repentance just a change of mind and a change of heart, or is it something else entirely? Is it turning from our sins and keeping the law if you think about that, you know, I think the answer is already kind of there. When you tell someone to turn from your sins, like we covered last time, sin is transgression of the law. And so if you're telling people to turn from your sins, are you telling them to keep the law before you can come to Christ? And so that's the topic of today's sermon. It's the subject of repentance. And it was John the Baptist, again, who came saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So these were the first words of John the Baptist's public ministry. It's the very first thing that he spoke. Jesus also said in another chapter in Matthew 14, 17, in the next chapter, the first words that Jesus spoke at the start of his public ministry was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So there's a double witness in God's word 
that we have to repent, okay? There's no question that repentance is a biblical thing. I don't want anyone to accuse me of preaching a repentless gospel, for example. That's what you, you sometimes hear, you know. We are all commanded to repent and believe the gospel. The question is in how we're defining the word repentance. Now, for some people, like I mentioned, this is just terminology, it's semantics. Some people will say, repent of your sins, and what they mean is admit that you're a sinner and, and turn to, to God by faith, and that's fine. For other people, they're literally saying that unless you stop sinning you, and you know, turn from your sins, you can't believe, you haven't, genuine repentance hasn't occurred. So, so ultimately, which is it? Now, we can turn to the Bible just like we did recently in the last sermon, in the last Matthew sermon, where we looked up the instances of the word wise men, which appeared in the Bible. And we did a word study, and we let the King James Bible define itself, right? So we looked up every instance, or the first instance, the second instance, the third instance of certain words. It's called doing a word study in the law of first mention. Okay, the first time that a word appears in the Bible is going to give you a strong indication of what that word means. Okay, we let the Bible be its own interpreter. The Bible is self-declaring. It doesn't need a defense. It doesn't need a dictionary. You know, it, it just, it interprets itself. So we're going to look at every instance, or not every, but many of the, because there's a lot of them, but a lot of the instances of the word repentance and let the Bible tell us what that word means. What does it mean when Jesus and John said, repent and believe? You know, so we're going to look at that and fill in that gap. And the reason why, you know, this is so important, this teaching is so important, uh, is because it can affect your salvation if you've believed in the wrong gospel. It can also make you ineffective for preaching the right gospel if you don't understand a basic doctrine like, like repentance. Even though it's a basic fundamental doctrine, that's not to say it's not a complex one, but we can look at it and, and understand what it means. So if you remember, um, and this might seem like a minor aberration from the Gospel of Matthew, but we really need to lay out you know, what, what repentance means. So the first time that repent appears in the Bible is in Genesis 6.6. 6. It's the very first book of the Bible. In Genesis, we get a groundwork and a foundation for what repentance means. And if you notice in Genesis 6.6, 6, if you have your Bible verse sheets there, or if you're turning into your Bibles, it was God who was doing the repenting. The very first time that the word repent appears in the Bible. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. So what happened here, it wasn't man repenting, it was God repenting. Now, obviously, God has no sin, right? He is without sin. He's perfect in all of his ways. So we can't automatically associate the words of sins to the word repentance, okay? Repentance, when taken by itself, we need to isolate what that word actually means so we can then use that in the context of the passages that we're reading and get an understanding of what it means. So it was the Lord who was repenting. Obviously, God wasn't repenting of his sins because he has no sins. What was he doing? And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. So God basically changed his mind about making man. So that, that very first time, God was grieved. He, he changed his mind about making man. That just taken by itself, let the Bible define itself. You know, at its outset, it just basically means to have a change of mind. Now, I believe it's a little bit more than that also in that it's not just intellectual assent, you know, it's a, it's a paradigm shift. It's turning from one worldview to another worldview. It's changing your view, changing your mind about what you believe about the person of Jesus Christ and the gospel. And we'll get to that in a bit. But that was the first time that we see repentance in the Bible. So just continuing this word study, Exodus 13, 17 is the next time that repentance appears in the Bible. And this was during the exodus of the children of Israel out of Egypt, okay? That, you know, that great exodus out of Egypt. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go 
that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near, for God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. So now people are repenting, but are they repenting of their sins in this passage? You know, when we're just looking at, you know, again, isolating repentance, what does it mean? The people were going to repent if they saw war after they just come out of that struggle of Egypt and they would change their mind and return to Egypt. Okay, they would change their direction and go the other way. So that's, that's what we see here, repentance. Because, you know, God didn't want them to go into the, to the battle right away to the Philistines, you know, through the land of the Philistines, you know, this formidable enemy after they just come out of Egypt, been through all that bondage and struggle. So he led them around a longer way so that they wouldn't turn back. They wouldn't repent of coming out of Egypt. So they wouldn't change their minds about that, basically. So we're seeing a, a pattern here when it comes to the word repentance. We just simply need to let the Bible define its own words. Exodus thirty-two fourteen, And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. So again, the Lord changed his mind. He was going to destroy his own people. And he repented of that. He's like, I'm not going to do that. So it was a, a change of view. Ultimately, it's not just intellectual assent. It's a change of view. It's a change of what you're going to you know, be, believe, do. I mean, it's a change. When you, when you come to the Lord Jesus and you understand that you're a sinner, you're naturally going to turn from some major sins. You're going to, you know, if you're a fornicator, you're going you're gonna to probably turn away from that once you realize that, it's, that God doesn't want you to fornicate, that he wants you to be married, that he, you know, he wants you to have a family. So the natural result of believing the gospel and understanding that you're a sinner is that you're going to probably turn from some of the major sins that you're committing. You know, that's a natural result of, of coming to the faith. But is that what saves you? Is turning away from fornication what saves you? Or is it the blood of Jesus? Is it the substitution? Is it faith in his, in his sacrifice that saves you? And so while I encourage people to turn from your sins, and I, you know, I, I preach more uh, turning from your sins to the church, you know, the church needs to repent of their sins. The believer just needs to understand that they can't save themselves and that they need to come to the foot of the cross and realize that, that they can't do it on their own and be saved. So that's, that's, being, that's backed up by the words of the Bible. If we're going to let the Bible define itself, it's backed up. So Deut Deuteronomy 32, uh, 36 is another time that repentance appears. It says, For the Lord shall judge his people and repent himself for his servants when he seeth that their power is gone and that, that there is none shut up or left. So for the Lord, again, repented himself for his servants. Again, we see God repenting more than anybody else in the Bible. You know, and of course, he doesn't have sin. Now, he's, it's not that he didn't know. He, he sees the end from the beginning, but he's, he's expressing himself in real time. That's how God felt. He, he wanted to destroy his people, but he didn't because he, he doesn't actually ever repent. He doesn't actually ever change his purpose. Um, and so these instances of repentance are just showing forth God's thoughts and mind in, in real time. Uh, judges 2.18, we keep seeing it. And when the Lord raised them up, judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. And it's not like I handpick these. I'm just going straight through like, you know, the first instances of repentance in the Bible. You can, you can look them up. Now, in some instances, people are repenting of sins, but it'll say they repented of their wickedness or they repented of their evil ways. And it's usually God's people doing that again and not, not for the purposes of salvation. So we just need to look at the context and understand, you know, what the Bible is saying in that instance. First Samuel 15, 11, God again repents of making Saul king. It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he is turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. So again, God changed his view. He changed his mind 
And it, we're just seeing a repetitive pattern of repentance being a change of mind, a change of view, worldview. It's coming from not believing the gospel to believing the gospel. It's changing your mind about who Jesus is and believing and turning to him by grace through faith alone. And that doesn't give us an excuse to sin like I've talked about almost in every sermon. You know, God will chastise us when we sin, when we do sin. Uh, and so it's not a free pass for how you live your life. But the, the salvation, the gospel itself is free. It's a free gift. And so uh, we have to preserve that, that doctrine. And so it's just, you know, it's, uh, it's doing a U-turn. It's, it's understanding that you're going one way on your way to hell. You know, you're, you're headed down straight to the path of hell because you don't believe in God. And when you repent, you're turning from not believing to believing, to, you know, turning and coming to Christ. So we see that, you know, everywhere. Now, you'll never see the phrase repent of sins or repent of your sins in the Bible. That phrase itself does not appear in any Bible other than the uh, NLT. So, you know, the NLT, the New Living Translation, or as some call it the Non-Living Translation, you know, corrupt God's Word. We went over some of that, you know, with the, with the majority text, the, the Textus Receptus. We'll get a little bit more into those Bible manuscripts. Uh, but we see that in every major English Bible, and of course in the King James, the simple word is repent ye and believe. It's never repent of your sins that appears nowhere in any real English Bible. So, but the NLT will say, repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now that's a problem because what is the NLT saying? It's saying to, you know, turn from your sins and turn to God. But that's a contradiction according to Philippians 11.6 where Paul lays out that very logical statement that it's either by grace or it's by faith or, or it's by works. It's either faith or works, right? There's no in between. And the moment you add any amount of works to grace, it's no longer grace. Okay, so the, this idea of repenting of your sins and turning to God is an interpretation of by the NLT translator is not a faithful translation of God's word. He, they're not translating for you. What they're doing is interpreting God's word and telling you what it means. And so, you know, that's, that's a problem in, in some of these modern versions. Psalm 110-4, the Lord hath sworn and will not repent. He won't change his mind. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So again, we're just seeing more verses on, on that. So, you know, the, the other criticism, like I mentioned earlier, is that it's not just a mental ascent. It's not just saying, okay, I believe, and you, you really haven't had a, a, cha a heart change, you know, by the Holy Spirit when you're born again. The key is, is you know, it's a, it's a paradigm shift, which means that your, your whole worldview is shifting. You're turning in your complete understanding and, and you're putting your faith on Jesus Christ. It's a change of really the heart, mind, and soul when you, when you think about it. Uh, because it's your whole being, it's, it's who you are, is turning to Christ by faith and understanding that you fall short of God's glory in, in every way. So it's a, it's a 180 degree turn from unbelief to belief. Okay, and then what comes after is sanctification when God does begin to work on your heart and, and begins to reveal what your sins are and how you need to turn from them and, and starts conforming you to his image. But it's something deep that takes place within the heart, mind, and soul, uh, you know, ultimately. Um, it's just, it's everything, you know, it's who you are is, is turning to Christ. So another example, Jeremiah 4.28, For this shall the earth mourn and the heavens above be black. Because I have spoken it, I have purposed it, and will not repent, neither will I turn back from it. So God is saying, I won't repent. There will be a day of judgment. There, will, you know, there is an end of, of the world, a time coming when he's going to return and, and judge the world in righteousness. Also, we look at other examples, like the Gospel of John also backs this up. The Gospel of John was written for unbelievers that they may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. John 20, 31, 
He literally writes out, here's the purpose why I'm writing this gospel. He says, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Okay, so that's the purpose of John's gospel. He spells it out. But the gospel of John doesn't mention repentance even once. Okay, it's not in the gospel of John, that word repentance, because ultimately... John just declared Christ and he told people to believe. So believing ultimately is repenting. You know, it's, it's practically synonymous with repenting because you go from unbelief to belief. So that's very telling. You know, when we look at gospels like John's that are written that ye might believe that Jesus is Christ. He outright says it's written for this purpose. It's the gospel that I usually give to non-believers and say, you know, you should probably start with the gospel of John. You've probably heard that. The reason is because of this verse. And nowhere in the gospel of John does it ever say to repent. Okay, we get that from, from uh, Matthew and, and Luke and, and, and Mark. So, you know, these are, these are things to consider when we, when we think about the role of repentance and salvation. Ultimately, it's just believing the gospel. It's just simple. Believe in Jesus, the real biblical Jesus, and you will be saved and, and receive eternal life. Um, so this is, you know, what John the Baptist and, and Jesus were doing. Because if we look at the context of Matthew 3... Um, and the context of repentance within Matthew 3, we see that Jesus, both Jesus and John, their audience, their intended audience was ultimately the nation of Israel and the unbelieving Jews. They were calling the nation of Israel to repent and to turn back to God. Okay, they were, you know, Israel had fallen into idolatry. They were, they were worshiping Baal. They were sacrificing their children on the altar of Baal, you know, they were doing all of that. And John was telling them to repent, you know, to turn from their idolatry and from, and from their evil. I don't think he wanted them to keep, you know, doing evil, but ultimately he was just telling them, you know, come back to the Lord. He was saying, turn back to your God and, and worship him alone. And so that's the context that, that John and Jesus were speaking to their to the nation of Israel, to the Pharisees, to the unbelieving Jews of, of that time. And you know, um, we see other instances like Acts 2:38, for example, uh, just to give you one final verse on repentance, because this is one that the opposition or the other side who does think you have to turn from your sins to be saved, what they usually say, is, well, what about Acts 2.38? It says to repent and you shall be, you know, receive the remission of sins. Well, they're, mis they're, they're mixing up the syntax in that because it's not saying to repent of your sins. Uh, and as we'll see in Acts 2.38, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So he wasn't saying turn from your sins and that's, that's why you'll be forgiven. He was just saying repent as in turn to Christ, believe the gospel and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. You will have remission of sins once you repent, which is coming to belief in Christ. So it's, all, it's pretty much synonymous. It basically means turning to, to Christ by faith. And so back in Matthew 3, you know, John the Baptist was saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And in verse 3, continuing in the gospel, for this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So this harkens back to Isaiah 40, starting at verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and height and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. So this was John declaring Jesus, who was about to come on the scene as the very God who would usher in the day of the Lord 
or the day of judgment that the prophets had all spoken about. Matthew 3, 4 says, And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. And so we have this picture of, of John the Baptist looking a lot like Isaiah and, or Elijah, you know, these old prophets that, that were to come. And uh, it's just a big contrast between Israel, which was overtaken by these fake client kings like Herod, and these unbelieving, you know, Pharisees like Caiaphas, the high priest, and they were all living in this, you know, luxurious style in, the, in their castles and, um, you know, in, in their palaces. And John the Baptist comes out of the wilderness wearing animal skins and eating locusts, which are like these grasshoppers, you know, these big grasshoppers that, that he was eating in just the wild honey of the, of the wilderness. And Jesus said later of him in Matthew eleven eight through 9, But what went you out for to see, a man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went ye out for to see, a prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. So John the Baptist was reminiscent of Elisha. He was just, you know, he'd come out of the wilderness. He wasn't relying on the world system. He was just a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, pointing the way to Christ. And 2 Kings 1.8, uh, we see this of Elisha. And they answered him, he was an hairy man and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, it is Elisha the Tishbite. So John the Baptist was coming in the spirit of Elisha. That was a fulfillment of, of prophecy as well, as we're seeing all of these prophecies fulfilled around Jesus. And Luke 1 says this about John the Baptist as the forerunner of Christ. It says in verse 15, Luke 1, 15, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb, and many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So he, this was a partial fulfillment of this passage because I believe Elisha himself will return again as one of the two witnesses. He seems to be the most likely candidate, although it's speculation to a great extent. It just makes sense that he would be the fulfillment uh, you know, of, the, of the two witnesses. And he himself was taken up, Elisha, as you know, in the chariot of fire uh, to heaven without dying. So, but all of this signified that, that John the Baptist was coming in the spirit of Elisha, just like prophets like Malachi had predicted. We see this in Malachi 3.1. Behold, I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. And Malachi 4.5 connects with that. It says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And so Malachi 4.1, it's not even conjecture, really, when you look at it, because it's saying that Elijah will come when at the great and dreadful day of the Lord, which hasn't come yet. So, you know, John came as the forerunner first, spiritually fulfilling Malachi uh, 3 and 4. But Elijah will literally return and fulfill that in totality at, at the end of the age. That seems to be the, the most clear way uh, to read that passage. So, you know, again, John the Baptist was an Old Testament prophet. And Jesus said of, of John in Luke seven twenty eight, For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So we are still, you know, if you think about it, we're still in the Old Testament in a way at this time, even though Jesus is, is there on the scene, at least, at least the, new, the Old Covenant until the shedding of Jesus' blood, which, which this all culminates to. Matthew 3, 5 through 6 
continues with John the Baptist. It says, Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. So, you know, all the people were were uh, repenting. They were changing their mind about God, about the way that they were living apart from God. And they were coming to, to John wholeheartedly. You know, it was genuine repentance. They were coming to confess their sins to God and were baptized in water. Now, they weren't necessarily confessing all of their sins because people don't know what all of their sins are. You know, we have unknown sins. We have ignorant sins. We have small sins. We have big sins, you know. But they were confessing the fact that they are sinners before God. And that's, that's the first step of salvation. And that's why, you know, when, when they tell you to turn from your sins, well, which sins are you turning from exactly? You know, do you have to turn from all of your sins to be saved or just some of them? You know, so that's, that's where it starts to muddy the gospel. And Matthew 3, 7 through 8 continues, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. So this is another passage. They're like, well, see, you know, you have to turn from your sins. You have to have that fruit to show in your life, you know, because even John said, bring forth fruit, it's meat for repentance. But you have to understand that John the Baptist knew what kind of lying hypocrites the Pharisees were. He knew who he was talking to. And when he saw them coming, he was like, you know, hold on. You know, he's like, bring forth the proof that you're genuine. Because he knew their character. And so understanding that in context answers that. Because he doesn't say that to the other people who are just simply coming and confessing that they're sinners and just coming as they are. So that's, you know, that's how we understand those passages. It was the Pharisees and the Sadducees alone because he knew their heart. He knew their character by the Holy Spirit. He knew them naturally, who they were as the religious community, as the religious leaders of, of their day. They were really there. They weren't there to repent. They were there to spy on John and see what this commotion was that, that was going on. And so what John says to them in verse 9 and says, And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Notice what John says to them. He says, don't appeal to your genealogy or your ethnicity or the fact that you're the children of Abraham according to the flesh, because God can raise up believers out of these stones. It's like Romans 3, where he says, you know, they are not of the circumcision who are of the circumcision. You know, it's kind of paraphrasing that, but it says, you know, the it's those who are those who are Jews inwardly are are the Jews, not those who are outwardly Jews by circumcision. And so he was rebuking these unbelieving Pharisees and Jews. He wasn't worshiping them and bowing down. He was saying, you know, look, you need to repent, and it doesn't matter if you're if you're you know child of Abraham, if your genealogy is of Abraham. You need to believe, and you, you need to believe genuinely. That was the criterion, was to believe the gospel, who, who John was pointing to. And so Jesus reveals it later in John 4, 23 through 24. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So he knew that they were you know, reading the law, you know, the letter of the law, and they weren't truly repentant believers. God wanted people with genuine faith who would believe him, and it's a, it's a spiritual thing. It's not a letter of the law thing. It's not by, you know, you're not saved by the law, as we talked about last week. The law points out that you're a sinner, and you're saved by grace. And so that was the purpose of the law, to be our schoolmaster. And so we're just seeing the same thing. He wants people that are genuine, born-again believers who have put their faith in Jesus and, and been regenerated. Matthew three ten through 12 uh, continues, and we see that John begins now to preach hellfire. Verse 10, And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast 
into the fire. So again, the context is he's saying that to the Pharisees when he starts, you know, bringing up hellfire and saying, you know, bring forth those, you know, those fruits worthy of repentance. But what is the good fruit that he's talking about here? What is the good fruit? It's the good fruit of salvation. It's the good fruit of genuine repentance, which leads to salvation. It's genuine belief in the heart, exactly what the Pharisees lacked. Verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So, you know, John the Baptist was a hellfire and brimstone preacher. You know, he, he wasn't shy to tell people that if you don't have your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are on your way to hell. And that is a major component of the gospel that's barely preached today. Uh, we need to, people need to understand that there is an eternal conscious punishment for the, for the dead, for the wicked, for the unbeliever. And so with this passage, we see that, you know, they're talking about the wheat. You know, they, they use these commonalities, these, the common sayings of, uh, of the times and, and just common props that, they, that Jesus and John both often used. And we see that the wheat are the saved. Okay, God will gather up at the end of the harvest, at the final reaping of souls before the day of judgment, uh, he'll reap those souls and he'll start to separate the wheat from the chaff and the chaff being the unbelievers. So a threshing floor that he talks about is a flat piece of floor, like a big, usually like a big circular, uh, you know, slab or, you know, made of stone often or, or wood or just a clear flat part of the earth that could be used where the farmer would spread out that wheat and they would thresh it. You know, and they'd use that, that winnowing fork or winnowing fan to separate all the chaff, which is like the little seed shells and casings and all the parts that were unedible and they would burn it up, right? So that was, it would just, uh, you know, it's a picture of that where Jesus is going to burn the wicked for all eternity after he separates them from the righteous. It's the that picture of the sheep and the goats being separated and, and you know, further on in the gospel. So that's what John uses as the analogy and he basically points to Jesus um, as the way to, to escape and to receive eternal life. Now we see that, um, you know, John himself, he's just a voice. He comes in, in humility. He comes in a state of humility. He's a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Everything about John was that he, he never pointed to himself. He always pointed the way to Christ. So as the forerunner, everything, when he said repent, he was just saying, turn to Christ, look to Christ. And so it was a, it was a state of humility that John was coming in. And John 3.30, John said, he must increase, but I must decrease. So this is a perfect picture of discipleship and following after Christ, something that we should do after salvation, you know, uh, turning from our sins after salvation, living a clean and holy life as the Holy Spirit enables us after salvation and becoming a disciple and committing our ways to him. So in relation to Christ, John the Baptist says in Mark 1, 7, which is a parallel, there cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. So he's saying, I'm not even worthy to, to stoop down and, and just, you know, to untie his shoes. Um, and so he comes in a true state of humility. And all he's saying is repent, turn to Christ, because he's about to come on the scene. It's in this context that Jesus, the one he's been pointing to, comes to him and asks to be baptized of him. And that's what we see in Matthew 3. The second half of Matthew covers the baptism of Jesus. Matthew three thirteen through 15. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness then he suffered him. So it's kind of a strange scene. Why is Jesus being baptized, 
by John the Baptist. You know, this was a call to repentance, and it was sinners that were coming to repent and get baptized. And of course, Jesus had no sin, and he had no need of repentance. So why was, you know, this even shocked John. Why was Jesus being baptized? Well, for one thing, it pictured Jesus' own death, burial, and resurrection. Okay, It was a, a type. It was showing forth what he was about to do. It also set an example that Jesus was baptized by water, that if he was baptized, that we also should be baptized by water. And so that's one of the things that we continue to do as New Testament saints is be baptized in water after salvation. And so these are some of the reasons, and these, that's the simple answer uh, to it. But there's a little bit more to it in that what it pictures is that Jesus took the, sin, the place of sinful man. Okay, He was a substitute. He took sinful man's place, and that's what that pictures. You know, the, the sinner is the one that needs to go and repent. It's the sinner is the one that needs to go and be baptized. And he literally steps into that place and says, I'm going to get baptized. I'm going to repent on behalf of the sinner. You know, he's, he's taking the, that place. He's being the substitute that he came to be. So it's just a picture of that. Um, and of course, you know, it just showed that we all deserve to die. It pictures that death, burial, and resurrection. And so Jesus goes on to the cross instead of us. And so that's, you know, that's why you know, we see him being baptized. And um, we see that in, in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, just to, just to uh, close out Matthew 3, uh, verses 16 through 17, ends the chapter. And Jesus, when he was baptized went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So ultimately we see the triunity of God. We see the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit present also. At, at his baptism, the entirety of the Godhead was present, either physically, spiritually, or audibly. Okay, we, we get, you know, God the Father speaking verbally, so he's audibly present there. The Holy Spirit descends as a dove spiritually, and then Jesus, of course, is there as the Son of Man, you know, in his humanity as well, uh, there at, physically as, as the Son of God. So you get, you know, a combination of physical, spiritual, and audible all present there, uh, the triunity of God displayed, and the Holy Spirit and everything, you know, descending as a dove. So it just shows forth that, you know, that God is triune. It's a very important doctrine that, that we're looking at. Um, and so it just shows forth all of that. So in, in closing, just to kind of close out a little bit and, and just reinforce what we talked about in terms of repentance, you know, um, the baptism, you guys understand, we've covered it many times, you know, that what it signifies, there's, you don't have to be baptized to be saved. Uh, it's something that comes after we do believer's baptism. But when it comes to repentance, just to kind of close out some of those thoughts on that, um, you know, again, repentance by itself doesn't mean to turn from your sins. It's just simply a paradigm shift. It's a, a change of mind, a change of worldview. It's when you realize that you've grieved God by sinning and that you are deserving of death and hell. And that natural response is to turn from sins, and we all should turn from sins, but it's not that act of turning from sins that plays any role in our salvation, because salvation is by grace through faith. If you remember last time we talked about in James, uh, it talked about if you break even one law, you've broken the entirety of the law. You're guilty of the entirety of the law. So this idea that, you know, I've seen the reason why we have to bring it up, you know, people like preachers like Ray Comfort, for example, you know, who I think is just so good at, at presenting the law and so good. He, he comes across so gracious and loving and he's so convincing and he's a nice guy. I think he seems like a really nice guy. You know, so I like Ray Comfort, but then he gets to that point. He convicts people of their sin and he's so good at pointing out the Ten Commandments that they've sinned. But I've heard him many times say, go turn from your sins, you know, and, and then come back and believe the gospel. 
Because if you're still a fornicator, you're not really, you know, you need to stop fornicating first before you can get saved. And so, you know, people have gone away in tears over that, that, I, that I've seen. So um, we can't bar the way to heaven. It's just simply by grace through faith. But you do need to understand that you're a sinner. There needs to be that conviction of sin. You, the Holy Spirit needs to convict you. It condemns the world of sin. You can't be a, you know, flaming homosexual and just be like, you know, yeah, um, I still believe in Jesus and there's nothing wrong with, with what I'm doing. Because you don't understand the gospel then. You're not believing in the real Jesus. You don't have conviction of sin. You don't understand that you're a sinner before God. And so it, it doesn't give an excuse, but we have to make sure that we're believing the right gospel. Just finally, the word repent. In the Greek, I don't often go to the Greek, but it's just such a simple word, metanoia. And, and if you follow through this, you can see for yourself what this word metanoia means. There's one underlying word in the original manuscripts, metanoia, whenever repent is in the Bible or repentance. And the King James translators translate that faithfully as one word, as repent. Okay, but again, you get like the NLT, they add three, four words to it of your sins instead of translating that one word. It's, it's dynamic equivalency or some textual critic kind of, kind of thing there. But it's ultimately just... You know, one word, metanoia, and when you look at that word meta, think about words like metamorphosis, where a change occurs, so or uh, metabolize, where a change occurs, and then you think about the word noia, and noia literally means uh, to exercise the mind or the thought. Okay, that word noia uh, in, in the original in the original meaning. Is just is the mind basically or thought or view so you have a change meta of mind or view noia so just in the very word itself it's inherent within it that repent simply means to change the mind to change the view to have a, a paradigm shift of, of the mind and so it's going from one belief system to another so I just hope that you know I really spent a little bit more time today Aberrated a little bit from the narrative of, of Matthew to really dig into to repentance, to look it up, to, to really explain what it means, because there's just such confusion today on, on this, and we have to preserve the doctrines of grace. I, I would just say, you know, be gracious with people who don't understand uh, repentance, and some people, many people are just mixing up the language on that, that, that are born-again believers, and they haven't looked into this doctrine that deeply, and it's not really being preached, you know, correctly in, in most, many churches. So um, keep that in mind as, as you go out and preach, and, uh, uh, you know, be sure to join us next week, and uh, let's just end with a, with a word of prayer. Father, we, we thank you, God, for the study of your word as we dug deep today into, into just a word study and understanding repentance and going through Matthew. I, I thank you for your word. I pray that you can bless us and, and bless our week. Be with us as we go out and, and do our work during the week as well and, and just interact with people and, and have opportunities to preach the gospel be with us this week on Wednesday as we go out soul winning and, and preaching the gospel uh, from door to door or at the universities as we go out. Uh, be with us as well. And let's see some souls saved. God, help us to plant those seeds and to save souls. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.